Abu Bakr then orders him to invade Syria. So he's going to basically miss Dura. He's going to go south of Dura, and he's heading towards Damascus. That's his goal, is to capture Damascus. Because the, the, the Muslim Arabs are thinking if they capture Damascus, they'll get Jerusalem in the aftermath because the Romans will be, there'll be an Arab army north of the Roman army, and they won't be able to maintain their supply lines, so they'll, they'll just simply retreat. And that's how they'll capture Jerusalem. Khalid takes his men across this really nasty chunk of desert in a logistical feat that would be hard to re replicate with a contemporary army today. He just takes his men through a spot that has no water and no food, and he gets them across. They show up in Syria, they come up to Damascus, and he captures the city. At that point, Emperor Heraclius is tearing his hair out, trying to figure out what to do, because all of this is a shock and a surprise. Nobody ever thought the Arabs were a threat. Where is this even coming from? So Heraclius goes to Antioch, which is on that map as Antiochia, but it's Antioch. And uh, they had renamed it uh, Theopolis, which is City of God. And he shows up, and he's hunkered down in there, and he gets together his generals, and he decides to launch a counterattack. And, and what Heraclius' idea is, you send four Roman armies, and you catch the four Arab, Muslim Arab armies in four separate locations, and you take them out piecemeal. Heraclius does not want to ever have a situation where he's bringing all four of his armies together because he doesn't have the economy to support having that many men in one location. There's just too few people. The infrastructure has fallen apart. Word reaches that the Muslims that there are these four armies now coming towards them. The commander of the four armies is a guy named Ubaida, Abu Ubaida. Abu Ubaida uh, was told that he was in command and Khalid was relieved of command. He could still be a general, but he would not be the guy in charge. And the reason is, is because the new Khalif, Abu Bakr, only lived two years as Khalif. He's dead. He's replaced by a guy named Omar ibn al-Khattab. The new Khalif is Khalid's first cousin, and he doesn't trust Khalid. He thinks Khalid has political ambitions, and so he's worried that if people like him too much because he's too amazing, he'll eventually try to become the new Khalif, and he'll do a political coup. So he demotes Khalid, and, and, but so Abu Ubaida orders the Arab armies to head over towards uh, where it says uh, al Jabiya. Uh, the problem is the, the Hassanids keep attacking them from behind. And so the, the Muslims try to figure out what to do. They decide to hold a conference. And then what they do is they ask an interesting question. Abu Ubaidah does, the commander. And the question he asks is, would you guys rather have Khalid in charge or me? And everybody looks at looks at him like, you know, we feel guilty saying this, but yeah, Khaled. <laughs> and he goes, me too. I would like to propose that we promote Khaled to being in command unofficially because I'll be officially in command. But, but unofficially, he'll be in charge. And everybody votes yes. And so he takes command of the army, even though he can't because he's been demoted. And uh, he comes up with a plan. And the plan is to head back a little ways towards Damascus to get away from the Ghassanids to a spot where the, the Muslim army, I don't know how I should do this. Should I aim myself like this? It's weird talking to you with my back. Well, I'll do it this way. So on the south end of the Muslim army is this giant ravine. And then there's a plateau. It's called the Plain of Yarmouk. And the ravine is the ravine of Yarmouk. And then across from the ravine is another ravine. So you can't really use them as an army because you'd be falling off a cliff to go into them. They're really steep. So he's got his left flank, his southern flank, covered by this ravine. And they just wait. 
which now forces, because now all four of the Arab armies are in one location, it forces the Romans to bring their armies together, which they didn't want to do. The commander of the Roman army is an Armenian named Vahan. But a huge chunk of this Roman army, probably about a quarter of it, was actually made up of Arabs, Christian Arabs. So this is going to be an Arab versus Arab fight at some core level. Vahan brings his army up and he puts it in between the second ravine in the west and the, the Muslim army. On day one, he does a really light, gentle probing attack just to try to figure out uh, what he's up against, how the Arabs are going to respond to his attack. He's just, just going up and touching to figure out what's going on. The, uh, the Arabs feel the pressure because they're outnumbered again. Now, this isn't Firaz level outnumbered, but it's still bad. We don't know the exact numbers, but it's probably in the ballpark that there were 120,000 Romans and about 40,000 Muslim Arabs. So the Muslim Arabs are outnumbered by about three to one. And so Bahan is just sort of checking things out because he knows these Muslim Arabs are good fighters. He doesn't want to do anything risky on day one. The sun goes down, they disengage, a few hundred people are wounded or killed. It's not heavy casualties. <clears throat> On day two, Vahan decides he's going to have the Roman left flank and the Roman right flank hit the Muslim army as hard as it can. Because he figures he's got the numerical advantage, hit them as hard as you can. So he orders that. The Muslim commander on the left is a guy named Yazid, and the Muslim commander on the right is a guy named Amr ibn al-As. And, and, and Abu Ubaidah is in the middle, the guy who's supposed to be in charge. And then Khalid's in the back, controlling everything. And the weight of the Roman army is so overwhelming, both Muslim flanks are collapsing. And they're in full retreat. And uh, in the north, on the Muslim right flank, the women. So it's worth pointing something out that's actually really interesting. Women have always been an integral part of warfare in all times. We pretend like we've just recently let women in the militaries. The Persians had an all woman archer division. The stories about the Amazons, that wasn't made up. That mythology was based on a real event. A, a rogue archer division of women, we don't know why, decided to go on a tear and attacked a bunch of Greek city-states on the Aegean Sea and burnt their temples and set their shit on fire. Oh, I cussed, I said I wouldn't. Uh, and they deserved it, just for the record. <laughs> and then the Greeks were so traumatized by this, they, they were like, we were attacked by Amazons. And they were, and it really did happen. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. Usually, women were support staff. They weren't in direct combat roles. Notice I didn't say it always, I said usually. For example, the Vikings fielded women. The Persians, the Vikings, the Armenians fielded women. The Romans did not ever field women, they were against it but women still played a support role in, their le in, the, in Roman legions. And the Arabs were the same. They, they did have some women warriors, by the way, just so we're clear. Um, but for the most part, mo there were very few women who participated directly in battle. In any case, the women on Amr ibn al-As's side uh, pulled down the tents, grabbed the posts, and charged the men who were retreating. And they shout at them, you've, you've shamed your wives, and now you have a choice. You can be killed by your wives, or you can be killed by the Romans. Bahan's blown away. He can't believe that he attacked a, a, an army a third the size. They broke it. It rallied and pushed them back. But he thinks, I've got it. I've killed enough of them. This was a bloody enough affair. I can probably break them the next day. So the next day, which is really day three at this point, 
he decides to focus everything he's got on the, the Muslim right flank. So he's going to ignore half the Muslim army. He takes everything and he smashes it in. And sure enough, the Muslims are being pushed back. And the women take the tent posts back and are holding it a line against their own men. And the Arab men turn around and re-engage and they stabilize the situation. Khaled brings his cavalry units around and he smashes into the Roman flanks that are attacking and they slowly push the Romans back and day three ends right where it began. Vahan is now really upset because he can't comprehend how he's not moving this Arab army, but he thinks, okay, I think we're still in this. So day four, he decides to do the same thing, push that same Muslim right flank. Just hit him as hard as you can with everything you've got. And the Khalid this time had assumed this was going to happen. So what he had done is he had redeployed his cavalry so that it would be able to respond more quickly. And he manages to stabilize the flank, even though it does start to collapse. They do start to fall back and they manage to push the Romans back and they stop day four right where they started. Day five, Vahan sends a guy to talk. And he's, he's ready to come up with a compromise. Like, maybe you get Jerusalem and we keep Damascus, something like that. Khaled goes, oh, the Romans only talk when they're losing. Okay, I'm going to refuse to talk. Day six, he took all his cavalry. It was about 8,000 men. Out of his 40,000 men, about 8,000 were cavalry. And he put all of them on his right flank. When the, when the sun came up, he swung it around. So now the Romans are trapped between his army and the two ravines. There was a bridge over the Western ravine. During the night, he had sent 500 cavalry around through the plain. They had snuck down into the ravine and they had captured the bridge. And his goal is to get the Romans to run towards the bridge because there's nowhere to go because the Muslims actually have the bridge, just the Romans don't know. And he comes swinging over the top and he smashes the Roman left flank really hard. He breaks the Roman cavalry unit that was there and he breaks the Roman army that was there. It's the cavalry unit and the army start to retreat. They're running in to other Roman units, sending them into disarray. And then the Romans try to respond with heavy cavalry. Vahan sees what's happening. He organizes his cavalry, he, he draws it in, but it's heavy cavalry and it's slow. Khaled comes in with his light cavalry and he attacks them before they can get into more formation, destroys them. Then he takes his cavalry and he slams it into the back of the Roman army. It breaks and goes into full retreat. And that's how he took 40,000 men against 120,000 men at Yarmouk and destroyed them. Vahan got away with, with a cavalry detachment. Khaled grabbed his fastest horses and his best men and they took off and they chased General Vahan. And they caught up with him just outside of Damascus. And Khaled lets his men tear up Vahan's men until the only man standing is Vahan. And Khaled had told his men, don't touch him. And then he comes up to Vahan and he says, you are a man, a man's man. And so I'm going to give you a man's death. And they dueled one on one and he kills Vahan. And then Khaled goes and recaptures Damascus. Emperor Heraclius holds a council and he asks his remaining generals, what should we do? And the generals tell him, we've lost Syria, it's done. There's nothing we can do about it. And so Heraclius gets on a ship and he says, farewell Syria, you have been a lovely province and now you will be a lovely province for the Arabs. And he withdraws. And that was the last time, second to last time, there was a Roman army in Syria. They'll, they'll get in one more time, but they don't really keep it for long. 